Uh, I'd like to talk about the liberation procedure for CCSVI. Uh, CCSVI uh, is a hemodynamic condition in which the cerebrospinal venous drainage is altered and inhibited. Uh, outflow obstructions of the internal jugular, vertebral veins, azagous veins, and their tributaries result in stasis and reflux, uh, re redirecting flow through vicarious circuits. Uh, as an effect, cerebral blood flow and brain perfusion is retarded, and this re may result in cerebral atrophy, venous microhemorrhage, uh, cerebral hypertension, and uh, may result in occlusion of the outflow veins and the dural sinuses. The acute etiologies of cerebrospinal venous insufficiency include jugular vein and dural sinus occlusions resulting from instrumentation and catheters, from high pressures in AV shunts, and hypercoagulable states, as well as in the supervenic cable syndrome that extends upward and prevents drainage uh, of the uh, normal uh, structures. Um, also, neoplastic encasements can cause those obstructions. Um, I'm going to try to not use the word MS in this lecture. And I think that we need to do, as Dr. Salvi was suggesting, not make this about MS anymore. But there is CCSVI, and those are the chronic cases. And this is, I think, the only time I will use the word MS. It is a chronic condition that does lead to chronic CCSVI. Radiation vasculitis has caused CCSVI. Remote trauma and iatrogenic ablation of the veins also leads to an obstructive process that leads to deficits. Um, cerebellar thoracic outlet syndrome also gives neurological uh, effects as well as well as MS. So I tried to lump these together. I'm sure I've left many out. We need to learn and categorize them so that we can look at this entity of outflow obstruction as its own entity. <clears throat> the clinical effects include headaches, acute visual disturbances, transient global amnesia, cognitive dysfunction, fatigue and weakness, papilledema, altered levels of consciousness, seizures, and may perhaps, as Dr. Salvi said, hypothyroidism. Um, these are not only chronic, but in the acute phase, one, we've, as interventionists, we've seen many patients with supervenic cable syndromes who have some of these symptoms. The pathology of CCSVI is similar to that of peripheral venous insufficiency. There's conduit outflow impairment, raising intermittently capillary pressures, resulting in capillary dilatation, elongation, tortuosity. The endothelium is injured. There's dilatation of interendothelial spaces, leading to extravasations and interstitial edema. Uh, hemoglobin is released into the brain, breaks down to hemosiderin, and ultimately into iron. Uh, there's macrothrombosis in capillary level. Infarcts occur in some of these syndromes, venous infarcts especially. Um, inflammatory process occurs in the brain and scar formation occurs in the brain. There are simple, uh, one can look at it simply in brain outflow. Um, there's basically uh, cerebral veins going to dural sinuses. And in the supine position, those drain uh, into the brachiocephalic vessels, and in the erect position, into the vertebral veins, and ultimately into the subclavian and brachiocephalic veins. This is the normal pathways. This is just a, a modification of Netter, and the brain drains uh, from the deep. 
I'll do that. From the deep structures uh, into the dural sinuses, and then ultimately from the dural sinuses down into the uh, jug into the jugular vein and the vertebral veins. Uh, and there are some collaterals through the face and the, uh, the neck, uh, cavernous sinus, ophthalmic veins, etc. The spine drains from anterolateral spinal veins and uh, posterior funiculi into the epidural plexuses, and these have segmental spinal veins uh, from the top of the spine to the bottom, uh, the vertebral veins, intercostal veins, lumbar veins, um, mm -hmm. lateral sacral veins. These then drain into the accessory hemiazygous, the hemiazygous, ascending lumbar veins, ultimately to the azygous vein and the superior vena cava. And I guess we have to look in all of those veins to figure everything out. Um, this, this is from Gray's Anatomy. Uh, I missed this. Damn it, I missed it. Could have, been, could have been a hero 40 years ago. The principal outflow through the internal jugular veins can be substituted completely by the large vertebral plexuses through communication at the cranial base. I mean, I have my colleagues here. Anybody ever thought of that before? Any of us? I never occurred to me uh, to, to even think about the vertebral veins. In fact, Never really thought about the jugular vein. We have two, what the hell, you get rid of one, it'll just go around to another vein. Um, in fact, I ligated my wife's jugular vein, just for fun. <laughs> um, the deep venous outflow from the gain, of, this is from, uh, from Gray. The deep venous outflow through the great vein of Galen can be substituted by choroidal, thalamic, striate, anastomoses towards the basal vein. And the venous watershed exists between the paraventricular white matter and a layer of the subcortical white matter. So collateral pathways through the basal and sylvian veins by the cavernous sinus to the pterygoid plexus. So this is, this is what happens when you have obstruction. Uh, but it was Gray who said in 19, 1858, as a 32-year-old man shortly before he died of smallpox, Simultaneous hindrance of principal and collateral venous outflow will lead to elevated venous pressure and eventual insufficiency of cerebral blood flow. And we, we ignored that. Shame on us. Well, we have to make a diagnosis now. So the, the standard ways of making diagnosis are uh, by Doppler, a hemodynamic study of the neck, uh, transcranial Doppler to look at deep, uh, deep cerebral veins, MR venography and CT venography provide uh, axial and uh, cross-sectional imaging and multi-formatted imaging uh, of the veins. And I think Dr. Hakey uh, will talk a little bit later about some of the other things that it does. Um, catheter venography is our, our typical and standard and probably most reliable way for us to evaluate uh, venous anatomy. And intravascular ultrasound, uh, I've found to be uh, quite helpful in certain circumstances. Uh, the ultrasound exam is a rather specific exam. Um, not being an ultrasound person, I'll do the best to, I, that I can to, and my understanding of this. Um, basically, uh, color flow and uh, waveform imaging uh, in a transverse direction at J1, J2, and J3, J1 being at the base of the neck, J2 being by the thyroid, and J3 above the bifurcation. And then longitudinal Doppler imaging of the vertebral vein. Um, both of these tests are done both in the supine and in the erect position, generally sitting. And the imaging is generally done in the end of inspiration. The end of inspiration increases is the time uh, or the beginning of expiration is uh, the maximum flow within those structures. Uh, we do then a, uh, uh, a temporal transcranial Doppler of the deep cerebral veins, and uh, then we measure the diameter of uh, the, we measure the cross-sectional area of the jugular vein at its largest uh, dimensions in the supine and sitting position. 
Um, and then we can subtract those to get the delta CSA of the internal jugular vein. And then we look for B mode imaging uh, of the internal jugular vein. That's, uh, that will give us a much better view of the anatomy of the vein, the valves, any other abnormalities that might be within the lumen of that structure. And that's usually done in the supine position when the vein is, no, is le least collapsed. None of this, however, looks at the outflow from the azagous vein very well. The findings on ultrasound include reflux in the internal jugular vein or the vertebral vein on either side, that reflux or reversal of flow lasting uh, greater than 0.88 seconds. Another finding is the absence of flow within the internal jugular vein or vertebral vein. In other words, it may just be stagnant back and forth, not really a draining and not necessarily uh, a thrombose, however. Um, reflux in the uh, deep cerebral veins on the TCD and a delta CSA um, less than zero. In other words, the cross-sectional area of the jugular vein is larger while upright than supine. That's not supposed to happen. Normally, your jugular vein is distended because there's greater flow in the supine position. But in this situation, the, with the flow retarded, the vein does not distend. And finally, abnormalities of B-mode imaging, such as reverse valves, ectopic valves, webs, septi, stenoses, etc. Uh, this is um, at the level of the uh, J3 area, and you're seeing the same color in the vein and the carotid artery, meaning that the flow is the same in those in the same direction in both, and that's an abnormal finding. And all you need to do is see it in one area, in one vein, um, and you have a positive uh, finding, of, and you need two of the five findings, so not that common. Uh, here's a case where there's, uh, on the right side, uh, the vein is not only uh, flowing in the same direction, uh, that's the small, vein is flowing in the same direction as the carotid artery, but it's also thickened and stenotic. So it's, that's the B-mode abnormality as well. Uh, this is the vertebral veins. The vertebral veins are often identified in a transverse projection. This is artery and vein, also flowing in the same direction. Uh, you can tell it's vertebral because we see a little shadowing. And what we're doing is imaging the area between the, for, the foramina transversarium, where the vein is no longer encloaked in uh, bone. And this is uh, deep cerebral veins. There should be um, not all one direction like this. This is abnormal. Um, and you can see that reflux in the normal patients is never seen. So reflux in the deep cerebral veins is always abnormal, and it's a common finding. Uh, this is a B-mode abnormality. It shows a septum in the vein. And uh, I think Fabrizio mentioned these findings already and their high correlation uh, with the multiple sclerosis. Damn it, I said it. Um, and most common ones are um, reflux and, and deep, deep, reflu uh, deep cerebral vein reflux. So reflux is the most common abnormality, um, but all of these findings are quite common. The stenoses are often very difficult to detect because most of the stenoses that I've experienced are low below and behind the, the clavicle very often, and you don't really get a good image to see those stenoses very well. 
Um, I'm not going to talk too much about MRV. I'm just trying to be complete here. Uh, it is the most common pre-catheterization imaging that's performed. Um, and it is often done in lieu of the ultrasound. Even though the ultrasound is the only proven uh, technique, um, and despite the, the difference in cost. So I, I have my, um, I'm holding myself out on the MRV uh, right now uh, in terms of whether it needs to be done before doing uh, catheterization. I think I will use it surely, and there are many clear-cut signs in, of CCSVI, uh, such as collaterals, um, uh, lack of flow in the dural sinuses, and it may have a, a lot of value in the long run in terms of uh, procedure planning, especially as we learn more about some of the, the augmentation of the test that our MR colleagues are uh, developing. But I think sometimes it overestimates stenosis, and it shows stenoses that are perhaps not real findings. They're, not, they're real findings, but they may not be fixed stenoses. Um, and they may miss some of the valves and some of the other very subtle webs that you that you they're really difficult to see uh, except in a momentary uh, snapshot. So you know this is what one sees on MR. Um, you can see, and my these are not great images, but what do I know? I barely can understand what I'm looking at, uh, and this is not working, but. At the bottom here, there's the stenosis here. And on the other side, I think I see a valve right here. And of course, you see there's lots of areas of narrowing up here. And I don't know what they represent. I'm not sure how real they are all the time. I think sometimes they are. But I think some of it may be flow phenomenon or compression phenomenon, etc. cetera. Um, this patient um, has limited flow within the dural sinuses, um, but we know that there were no problems with her dural sinuses at all uh, down the line. And of course, the imaging that I do, uh, or what we were doing at the time, uh, this, um, this real streaky stuff makes it really difficult for me to comprehend what I'm looking at. But clearly, there's abnormalities here. And if this were presented to me, I would say the patient has enough evidence to go on to do catheter uh, work. Um, but sometimes there's really, mis I believe, some misleading findings here that you see these types of narrowings. Um, and I'm concerned that people are going to end up starting to stent things like this without really being sure what they represent now. Uh, they happen to, hap happen to happen in three distinct locations, right down here. I believe that's where the strap muscles exert some pressure on the vein. Um, up here, where the carotid artery indents the jugular vein. And up high at C2, uh, these are very, very common areas for narrowing. Um, and I think we have to be cautious before we conclude what they represent. Um, Uh, this is a patient who um, had, uh, let me go back here, incomplete visualization of the dural sinuses. And yet when we inject the right uh, jugular vein, this narrow jugular vein, we're able to see the dural sinuses are quite normal. And um, when I first saw this, I thought this was pretty insignificant narrowing. Uh, but it is not insignificant, and this is really uh, abnormal, uh, as is this. Um, so I think the catheter venography uh, is the gold standard for studying the anatomy, the, the pathological uh, imaging anatomy. Uh, it can help us look at flow by the way we inject our contrast. And it can show reflux and stasis uh, very nicely. And it also shows very nicely uh, stenoses um, that are per persistent. And of course, we can see intraluminal pathology, 
the abnormal valves, the septi, uh, the webs, etc. Uh, to my mind, at this point, it's the only decent way to look at the azagous vein and the lumbar veins. Um, hopefully, we'll, we'll come up with better ways to look at the screen for that stuff, but right now, I think it's the only way we can do it. The procedure is simple, requires no sedation. In fact, I prefer no sedation because I really prefer to have the patient cooperative enough because breathing function is a really a very important part of the test, and it's very important that one uh, maximize flow in order to see how distensible these compliant veins are. Um, and we can use it as a therapeutic uh, at the same time as our diagnostic test. Um, it really is an outpatient procedure. And patients really uh, can go home very quickly after the procedure. So this is the standard technique that was proposed by Dr. Zamboni. Uh, it requires a left femoral uh, vein access. Most people that I've talked to have been doing a right femoral access because we are more comfortable doing right femoral access. And when, when I queried Dr. Zamboni about why he recommended this, it was an interesting answer. He told me that he wanted to look at the uh, iliac vein, and he wanted to look at the lumbar veins, and he really couldn't see them very well uh, any other way. And I said, why didn't you put that in your paper? And he said, the editor removed it. So a lot of us have been a little bit misled by the editor. I don't mean the journal editor, I meant the editor of the paper. So anyway, the left femoral axis is what's used. It allows you to get a, a, a quick look at the uh, left iliac for a May Turner narrowing, uh, and then selective catheterization of the left ascending lumbar vein, uh, and a spot image there. The goal of those two venograms is not necessarily that there's an association between May Turner and CCSVI, it's that if you have a May Turner and you have CCSVI, you've got a double whammy that makes the, your venous outflow that much worse. You've lost some of the collateral flow that eggs, gets the, flu, the blood out of the spine. So that's why they do that. The ascending lumbar venogram at the current time really doesn't help us treat the patient, but it's helpful in terms of understanding especially those with the primary progressive form of the disease, so we can start to understand what their problems are so that maybe we can figure out how to take care of that in the future. He also does a left renal spot, and the reason he does that is to look for a narrowing of, of the renal vein and other uh, veins that drain around that might be used as collaterals as well. And he gets that done very quickly. They basically, the way they do it in Ferrara is they do a, a roadmap image and store a roadmap image. So it's just a single image, and then you're done with them. And then the, then the real work begins uh, with an azagous venogram and then bilateral jugular venograms. Um, um, there are many different catheters. I wouldn't presume to tell that anyone is any better than any other. It's a relatively straightforward catheterization of the azagous vein. The jugular vein can be much more difficult than the azagous vein. Um, the way they do it is they put the catheter centrally uh, near its orifice, and they do a hand injection uh, or a slow injection of 3 ml per second, and they're looking to see how far back it refluxes and how quickly that washes out. And then once they do that, they do a power injection of 8 to 10 ml per second. Um, and that's a pretty good way to distend the vein, uh, get the contrast to go into go all the way up or all the way out in the, in the azagus. And I think that rapid filming is sometimes very valuable for some of the findings which are quite subtle. I think it's important, and I think a lot of, uh, I certainly had difficulties when I started using full strength contrast media. I thought it would be better. It turned out really not to be better because you'll really hide webs and septi and things like that. Uh, the, I don't believe the pressures are very helpful. They're all low and they, if there's abnormality, they might go up a couple of millimeters, but they don't really, 
it's not a pressure phenomenon, it's a flow phenomenon in the vein. Uh, the views of the internal jugular vein are frontal and a steep oblique and whatever you need to do. And the azagus is an interesting vessel. I think that most people that are, most images you see sent to me or uh, even published show a 30 degree oblique and it really doesn't lay out the azagus varying very well. I think it's much more helpful to do a true lateral view and then an off lateral of the arch of the azagus vein. And that's when you'll see those findings a lot better. Um, then a third view could be either one of those first two views or a simple frontal view to see the distal veins, uh, the hemiazygous vein and the ascending lumbar veins. Now what is the pathology? The pathology is quite interesting. Um, there, as we know, there are uh, acquired causes of uh, the CCSVI and they have the typical narrowings that we used to after instrumentation and catheters, focal stenoses, somewhat longer stenoses, linear stenoses. And then you have the congenital variety. The congenital variety are quite interesting. Uh, they often are valvular problems. Most of the real narrowings are truncular near the orifice and they uh, include things like reverse valves, so that as flow comes down, it's obstructed by the valve. Uh, incomplete uh, valves, where they might only have one broad leaflet, or fused valve leaflets, uh, or misplaced valves. One of the earliest uh, uh, indications of this disease that Dr. Zamboni saw was when he was, uh, I believe, a house officer uh, in Sardinia early in his career. And he found a series of patients who had these aneurysmal dilatations in the neck. Uh, and they turned out to be abnormal uh, jugular valves that were like protruding out. And uh, he told me that all those patients developed multiple sclerosis. Damn, said it again. Um, you can see false channels or uh, webs. Webs, I'm defining a web as uh, a horizontal or, you know, um, pretty much horizontal, narrow uh, membrane or a uh, single leaflet valve that just sits there like the top of a garbage can lid that goes up and down. Uh, septum is more of a vertical process that's almost like what we would call in an artery a dissection. Um, and then you can see all kinds of distorted and abnormal drainage in the external jugular and the vertebral veins, sometimes stenosis, thickened valves, et cetera, in those vessels as well. You can get narrowings that are a variety of types, a single, multifocal, uh, circumferential uh, narrowing, uh, like an annular stenosis. Sometimes you see areas of, sorry. <laughs> Somebody's not coming probably. I'm not kidding. Sorry, let me turn the sound off. I can use a catheter better than I can use a phone. Right? It's not working. Okay, sorry. Uh, the narrowings can be hypoplastic areas, sometimes short sometimes long segments, sometimes uh, intermittent segments of stenosis. I've seen a case where the vein narrowed, into, divided into two pieces, two very narrow strips that reconnected to a normal looking jugular vein. Uh, they are malformations. Uh, um, sometimes the vessels twist and they can be straightened out. And sometimes there's these indentations that are very confusing. Um, where do they occur? Most of the abnormalities occur near the jugular confluence with the subclavian vein. They less frequently occur in the uh, J2 area uh, or in the J3 area. Um, the azygous lesions often also occur at the confluence with the superior vena cava. Um, and uh, they can, more, you see more twistings and membranes in the 
the, the more distal um, or peripheral azygous vein. And of course, the lumbar veins uh, can be all hypoplastic and stenotic in multiple areas. I caution uh, worrying about, I, ca I worry about it, but I caution interpreting narrowings that one sees at the jugular bulb at the skull base uh, or in the dural sinuses on MR or at the area of the carotid bulb or above uh, C2. Um, my thinking on this process is that if you have an outflow obstruction, you have a dual, uh, dual folks, uh, you have two ways to drain the brain uh, in the neck. One is from the vertebral and one is from the jugular. So if you have an outflow obstruction of the jugular vein, the vein doesn't get big and fat and distended because it has no place else to go. It has some place else to go. So the blood gets rerouted away from the jugular vein and the jugular vein is essentially underfilled. So anything that's adjacent to it, it, it will collapse it in those areas. So I'm, I'm very worried about those and I really don't want to treat them unless I have to because I think that a lot of them are not real. Um, let me show you some interesting uh, images of uh, the diagnosis here. Uh, here's a patient with uh, some, uh, some narrowings uh, up here. And, but this is a vertebral vein superimposed on the orifice of the jugular vein. I think these are abnormal vertebral vein valves. And if you look at it carefully, that's a high-grade stenosis. So one of the things that happens is you inject some contrast. The contrast washes around at the orifice of the jugular in the subclavian or in the vertebral vein, and it hides the stenosis. So that's why rapid film sequence is very valuable. Um, and sometimes gentle injections are better than you know, big, strong fat injections. Uh, here's a valve sticking out of the side of the jugular vein. Uh, it's not doing work very well, but. I think you can see it. You can see some of the, the edge of the valve leaflet here. This is a big, this is what Zamboni had uh, that developed into these venous aneurysms in the neck. Uh, again, this is a big collateral of the external jug going into the subclavian. And it looks like a stenosis there, but these are all collaterals. Uh, this thing's not working. It would be nice to, yeah. Um, and you can see there's abnormal valve structure in the external jugular. The internal jugular looks really doesn't, it's really misleading because when you go very slowly and inject it without having all this reflux that fills all these collaterals, you have a very tight stenosis. I'm afraid that people have sent me cases that said, they said there was nothing there and you see something like this and it's buried and you have to be very careful. It's not that simple. Uh, this is a very interesting case. Um, of the value of doing the injection very proximal. Uh, catheter is up in the middle of the uh, jugular vein. There's a big collateral that fills here, and then it dumps out down here. And I, I knew there was an obstruction in here because of this collateral. The collateral pointed that there had to be something between these two areas that was causing an obstructive lesion, and it's not really a stenosis. So I just kept pulling the catheter back and, and testing it, and you see that fine membrane there? On these examinations, the earlier ones, the catheter pushed that up. It pushed the membrane out of the way. That membrane's sitting horizontally in the jugular vein, and when the catheter went up, it pushed it out of the way, and you can't see it. So injecting very close to the orifice is very helpful in detecting some abnormality like this. This uh, can be very misleading. This is a very interesting uh, extrinsic compression. Uh, the vein looks really abnormal. There's a lot of collaterals going back towards the spine. Um, and, but pulling the catheter back and doing a shorter injection, you see this big thumbprint in the jugular vein. Uh, we didn't really figure that out until our second ultrasound, and there's a muscle impinging on the jugular vein. So I don't know what to do about this one. I think either a stent or release of that muscle is going to be effective in taking care of this stenosis. Um, the azygous is really challenging, in my opinion. Uh, first of all, you can see how bad this study was. 
uh, it's too dense. You really couldn't see anything if you tried in here. Uh, and you're, you're not looking at the, the vein in profile. You're looking at it like this instead of like this. So that's no good. This one's even worse. You really can't see the arch at all. The arch is really sitting front to back, and it's all superimposed on itself. Um, sometimes what you'll see is just contrast hanging up underneath the valve leaflets. And you can see how distended this is behind it. Um, but this was, I finally figured it out. This is a true lateral view. Uh, this is the azagus arch going into the descending azagus vein. This is the uh, SVC here. And a very light injection going back shows one, two, three sets of abnormal valves in the azagus vein in that small area of the arch. And you can see how the contrast streams past the valves. And as we'll talk later on, when you look at this with Ivis, the valve doesn't open and close. It just sits there. So you have a pinhole from the valve filling it out, going to the next area, and back and forth. Uh, the azicus can also kink. And I'm not sure exactly what the significance of this is. We all thought this meant that the vein was twisted. And yet, uh, Dr. Omari in Jordan uh, sent me a case uh, where he had the patient take a much deeper breath, and this straightened out. So this may be somewhat of a redundant vein in some way that in certain parts of the phase, it, it twists around. Very interesting. Uh, there are other abnormalities. And, and I, like I said, I mean, these, these are some of the ab, uh, confusions. Uh, many people have sent uh, studies, uh, patients mostly, have said, I have a, a, a an occluded jugular vein. And this is not an occluded jugular vein. This is a vertebral vein. And these are uh, a whole variety of uh, uh, deep cer uh, cervical veins and uh, external jugular veins. But somewhere hidden behind here is the, verte uh, the jug internal jugular vein. And sometimes uh, people are missing these very, very obviously. Um, this, again, another case of thrombosis of the jugular vein. And now some of this, this is just nice illustrations of some of the bizarre pathology that one sees. Um, you see a vein divides and then comes back together here. Um, I can't see very well, but there's all these irregularities of these veins. These are not the jugular vein, but I imagine whatever malformation occurs in the jugular vein is occurring in all these veins as well. And these are hypoplastic um, lumbar veins. I'll skip that. Uh, Fabrizio's already mentioned that. Um, these are valvular malformations for a, a large percentage of these cases. And therefore, they're fairly resistant to uh, angioplasty. Um, it requires fairly large balloons um, in Ferrara, they used a maximum diameter of 10 millimeter balloons and had the results they got. I'm not sure anybody's getting that much better results using bigger balloons, but we in the United States are more comfortable using bigger balloons. I've been using cutting balloons when that valve is just kind of really tight and stuck on the IVIS, and then uh, ballooning at 14. And I'm not sure that's going to be good enough. I think there's going to be a role for uh, stenting uh, a lot of these cases uh, in the future. But of course, the patients were very reluctant to undergo stenting early on in this because of uh, a single complication that occurred related to a stent uh, in Stanford. Uh, so, but what is a significant stenosis? A good question. And I think that 40 to 50 percent uh, uh, luminal diameter is probably significant. We're dealing with low pressure systems and uh, I think there are other things that we can look at. For example, if you put the contrast there and you see it just sits there, it doesn't wash out very quickly. Sometimes it stays 8, 10, 12 seconds. Um, that's a significant uh, finding, I believe. So um, normally the veins flow towards your heart. That's just the rule of the game. And in CCSVI, there's outflow obstruction of many causes. Um, angioplasty can be quite effective 
in changing the patient's symptomatology. Extraordinarily, some of the patients respond before you complete the examination. I've seen spasticity go away within five minutes of uh, dilating the azagous vein. Uh, patients often, by the time they get off the table, say they look, they feel clearer in their head. Um, sometimes they start sweating before the exam is finished and they haven't sweat in four or five years. Very interesting. So I think it does relieve headaches and fatigue. Some of the temperature intolerance goes away quite quickly. Uh, cognition is, and vision also improve quickly. And, you know, sometimes uh, perhaps we can just get the patients to rehab they'll get stronger again, you know. So I think that this is a very promising area. I think we have so many technical challenges that in terms of diagnosis, in terms of catheters, in terms of uh, stents, uh, we have a, you know, it's a, this is another five, this is one of those five-year projects that, that periodically happens in interventional radiology. You know, we all, we all get into a frenzy over this and we go to the meeting and everybody's all excited for a while, then it becomes mainstream. So I think that's where we are right now. Thank you very much.